Thank you for joining me on UCSD Guestbook. Tonight, it is my pleasure to welcome Martin Raff from University College London, who is presenting the Kuffler Lectures, which he has entitled Regulation of Mammalian Neural Development. Welcome, Martin. Thank you. Martin is a polymath whose research has boldly illuminated the terrain of immunology, developmental neurobiology, and cell biology. He strikes like lightning, blazing trails that are eagerly followed by others, much like Stephen Kuffler, in whose honor this lecture series was established. Martin's lectures have focused on large and fundamental problems. How is size regulated? What controls differentiation? How is cellular diversity specified? Among his many laurels, he is a fellow of the British Royal Academy uh, and the uh, foreign member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the US National Academy of Sciences. Martin, your research has made myriad contributions to many areas of biology. Even in your Kuffler lectures, there's an enormous uh, sweep of uh, material that you are covering. How do you select the problems on which you work? Well, I think it's a combination of you make a chance discovery, you could see that this has potential being interesting, and so you move off in this direction that you'd never anticipated. But I th one of the things that have, has motivated me throughout my career as a scientist is to stay away from the crowds, to try to find areas where others are not working, uh, just in the hope that uh, you'll have a few years where you can relax and do it at your own pace and maybe you'll make a discovery that others uh, are not going to make a day or two later or even worse a day or two earlier. <laughs> you have also a penchant for selecting l large problems, big problems, important problems. Uh, how, d how do you achieve this? What, what leads you to focus in that way? Well, I'm not a details person, I should say, just my personality is I'm more interested in the bigger, the conceptual questions and to try to find a way of addressing uh, those questions. It's just my personality. I, I find it very hard to focus on detail so that once I got, have a general feeling of how something works, my tendency is to move on and let others uh, do the detailed analysis. Did your early training, uh, either as a physicist and mathematician or as a medical doctor, uh, influence some of these choices? No, I don't think so. I'm not one of these people who, from the age of three months, knew I wanted to be a scientist. In fact, it came as a great shock to me uh, that I could do this and was interested in doing it because it wasn't the plan. Uh, so. No, I can't look back and see anything in my history that would have predicted this. Mm -hmm. In your career, as I noted earlier, you have really made a series of saltations, uh, leaps from uh, immunology to developmental neurobiology and, and to cell biology, and I will look forward to exploring some of that together this evening. Uh, what prompted these, these, these leaps from one area to the next? So when I was training as a neurologist uh, and I had made a decision to leave the country and go to Britain, I, I, I was going to be a neurologist, a clinical neurologist. And uh, classically what you do if you want to be an academic physician is you spend two years in a lab. And that was what I did. I went to Britain, to London, uh, to spend two years. And I asked a friend one day while walking down the hall, what should I do? And he said, well, I did immunology. That's interesting. Why don't you do that? And I said, okay. I didn't know much about it, but so it was not at all thought through and it was just chance mm -hmm. who I happened to meet in the hall. Mm -hmm. And just about every stage in my career has been exactly that, a chance thing that determined whether I did this or that. So once I did immunology, uh, one evening my mentor, who was moving from a research institute to University College, uh, said in, in the pub, you know, if you ever wanted to stay in Britain and remain a scientist rather than going back back to America and be a clinician, uh, it would be nice to have you when I move. Well, that night, it was the first moment I'd ever thought that maybe I'd make a career in science. Yes. And I made the decision right then and there, that's it, I'm going to give up all these years of doing medicine, I'm going to be a scientist. Yes. But again, there was a chance conversation in a pub. Yes. 
Well, as Pasteur said, uh, chance favors the prepared mind, and, and I suspect that your mind had been very well prepared uh, for, uh, for some of these decisions. L let me take us to some of your early, the aspects of your early career. You were a pioneer in the use of, of monoclonal antibodies, antibodies uh, generated by single cells and, and cl a clone of, uh, uh, from that single cell in the immune system. Uh, why? were those particularly useful and, and perhaps you could also uh, tell us about some of the difficulties of using these these molecules in the early years. So when I was an immunologist uh, I suppose my major contribution was to use antibodies as tools, not monoclonal antibodies because they had not appeared on the scene yet, but just antibodies as tools to identify and separate cell types in the immune system. In those early days it was thought lymphocytes that make immune responses are all the same. Turned out they were not. They're subclasses that do different things, but they all look the same. And so it turned out you needed a way of distinguishing the different classes and antibodies were incredibly useful tools because not only can you identify them, but you could pick them out and study them separately. Mm. So then when it became time, I decided I was going to be a scientist now, not a clinician. Uh, then one had to decide on some plan. What are you going to do? Are you going to be an immunologist? Or? And the decision was, well, I'll use the same strategy, that is, use antibodies as tools to identify and manipulate cells, uh, but now do it in the nervous system. After all, I'm a clinical neurologist. I should know something about the nervous system. Little did I know, I knew absolutely nothing about the nervous system. It's a totally different type of thing to do, actually, to study the biology of the nervous system as opposed to diseases of the nervous system. Uh, but anyway, that was the way I got to using antibodies to study cells in the nervous system. But the fact was, using the same strategies to make antibodies that were specific for different classes of lymphocytes actually didn't work making antibodies that would recognize one type of neural cell from another. Mm. Uh, and so when monoclonal antibodies came along, uh, this was a revolution. Uh, because now you had real specificity, mm -hmm. and uh, that revolutionized uh, the course of my experimental experience. Yes. And uh, so we jumped on monoclonal antibodies and started using them. Well, your, your strategy, as you so aptly uh, uh, describe it, has, uh, is one that has been picked up by uh, innumerable uh, scientists around the world and, and used to great effect, not only focusing on antibodies, but uh, using markers like transcription factors to identify cells. And so the intellectual lineage that uh, you have left uh, behind you there is really uh, uh, quite marvelous. Uh, you're, you're a leader of an elite group of neuroscientists who, for the most part, don't work on neurons. Um, uh, in fact, you have uh, brought uh, glial cells into prime time, I think, uh, Martin, uh, by your uh, uh, work with them. Glial cells, of course, we used to think of them as the glue of the nervous system. Now we know that they have a host of, of different functions. Uh, uh, how did you decide to work on glia in, instead of working on neurons? So when we decided that it would be a good idea to try to make antibodies as markers to distinguish and separate cell types, uh, then it turned out that the first markers we had actually distinguished uh, glial cells. Mm. So that was kind of a chance thing that mm -hmm. took us into glial cells. The second thing that made glial cells our cells was I really can't work with complexity. My mind doesn't work on complexity, so I need simple well, we systems. We could debate that point, well, Martin. I, I, yeah, I know you I too mean, well, yeah, but yeah, so, I so We worked, we started with a peripheral nerve because it, when you took the peripheral nerve apart, there were only a few cell types. Uh, and that, we were able to make progress identifying the cells, separating the neural cells that turn out to be glial cells because there are no nerve cells themselves mm -hmm. in the peripheral nerve. So they're processes of nerve cells, but in the nerve they're just the supporting or glial cells. So that's where we started. And then when we started saying, okay, now it's time to move into the central nervous system, we went to the optic nerve connecting the eye to the brain because it too is relatively simple and there are no nerve cells there. Mm -hmm. So it was the drive for simplicity that made us go after glial cells and the chance observation that the antibodies we first had mm -hmm. identified glial cells. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's apparent as one looks at the nervous system that even on a casual inspection, different classes of cells have consistent sizes uh, and that the numbers of cells in, a, in a, a, an organ such as the brain and even in other organs is, is quite constant. Um, how are these processes regulated, size and, and number? 
So it's complicated because there are two kinds of mechanisms that operate to control every behavior of a cell. Uh, its growth, its shape, its function, and so on. There are programs running inside cells. And the program that a particular cell has at any moment uh, reflects its history, where it came from, what its mother cells were, and so on. Uh, but in addition, every cell in your body is regulated by other cells because it's very important that every cell behaves in a way that's best for the whole organism. So there are these internal programs that give a limit to what the cell can do, and then these signals from other cells actually dictate what mm -hmm. the cell will do, whether it's going to live or die, whether it's going to move, whether it's going to mm -hmm. divide. Uh, so it's a combination of internal intracellular programs and extracellular signals that come from other cells. Yes. During evolution, the size of the, of the primate uh, brain increased in some species, notably our, our, our own. Uh, what mechanisms uh, do you think are likely to have contributed to the, to the increase in size of the, of the hominid brain? Yeah, that's, a, that's a great question, but the fact is we have no idea. And the reason we don't have any idea, I would submit, is not because this is a particularly difficult question. It simply hasn't caught the imagination imagination of developmental biologists or developmental neurobiologists until quite recently. So uh, again, it could be that intracellular programs that live, the reason our brain is bigger than a mouse brain is because there are many more cells there. And the reason there are many more cells is that on average, the cells that give rise to the brain in a human divide many more times than those in a mouse. So you get many more cells. And the question is why mm -hmm. do these cells divide so many more times in a human than in a mouse? And how much of that is programmed inside the cell, because there are such programs that control how many times you divide, uh, and how much is related to the signals from other cells that drive the cell divisions. Because mm -hmm. without those, you don't divide at all. Mm -hmm. So are they around longer, and therefore you divide longer in the human, or are the programs different? If you had a guess, and it is a guess because nobody knows, I would say it'll be a combination. The programs will be set differently and the signals will be around longer and it'll be a combination. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I, I share your sense that this is an important problem and hopefully uh, people will... Somebody will, will pick up on will it. Pick yes, up yes, on yes it that would be wonderful. Run with it. The, uh, the acquisition of, of form, the basic shape of tissues, uh, either organs or indeed the, the whole body of the organism, now, seems to be appearing now on the horizon of, of the life sciences as a, as a major next big problem uh, and I'm, I'm wondering if you think that uh, people will pick that up and that major progress will be made over the uh, immediate future years ahead well it's interesting that the the problem of patterning that gives you the shape of your nose and your ears and so on and why your face is different from my face uh, there's actually been much more attention paid to patterning and we know more about it than actually size control mm -hmm. even though this is a sub set of the size problem because it's local growth that gives you your nose being bigger than uh, you know par other part of your face mm -hmm. uh, and there we know that there's all kinds of complex signaling between cells stimulatory signals inhibitory signals and they're graded so that there's more here than there is here and those are the things that seem to control the shape of a particular part of the body yes so it's odd peculiar just a chance of history that we actually know more about patterning structure than we know about overall size control yes yes please stay with us we'll break away for a moment but we'll be right back for this uh, engaging discussion with martin raff back to UCSD guest book and our stimulating discussion with Martin Raff. 
Martin, I'd like to take our conversation in a slightly different direction now and uh, explore some of the, the broader issues about which you've thought deeply during uh, your career uh, and, and perhaps start with the uh, observation, one of your uh, experimental findings, that it's possible to generate uh, uh, glial cells of the nervous system from embryonic stem cells. And I, I want to ask how you view the potential both for basic knowledge on the one hand and for uh, therapeutic uh, treatments of the use of embryonic stem cells? Well, they're fascinating cells because they're capable of giving rise to every cell type in the body, so this makes them unique. And uh, they have potential in the sense that if you happen to suffer from a disease in which cells die, a heart attack, a stroke, head trauma, and so on, potentially you could have an ES cell line give rise to the nerve cells or muscle cells or whatever cells you happen to need uh, to replace the cells that have been lost. And in a condition like diabetes, where the cells that make insulin die, thought to be an autoimmune destruction of those cells, uh, if you could replace those cells uh, and the ES cell lines, uh, the embryonic stem cell lines, provide that potential. Because in mouse, at least, where one first defined these cells, you now can be manipulate the cells to get almost any cell type you want. And so a few years ago, uh, it was found you can isolate embryonic stem cells from humans. Mm -hmm. So that's opened up a whole possibility of clinical use. And now, most recently, as you no doubt saw in the, uh, this, in the newspapers, that a Korean group has managed to replace the nucleus in an embryonic stem cell with the nucleus of uh, an animal or a human, in this case, uh, that would potentially need the cells at the end. So now, the embryonic stem cells are more or less your cells. Tailored tailored to you, and mm -hmm. your immune system won't reject them. So I think the potential here is enormous, no question about that. But you'd have to say that these are very early days, and in a mouse, if you give embryonic stem cells to an adult mouse, you get a tumor almost every time. So what you need to be able to do is induce the embryonic stem cells to become the specialized cells that you need make sure there are no residual embryonic stem cells before you transplant them. So this is not absolutely straightforward technology, but it's moving very quickly. Mm -hmm. And my suspicion is that in the next 10 years, uh, there will be a breakthrough. Somebody will use a cell made from an embryonic stem cell to uh, help a patient, and that will be a revolution. Wonderful application of basic science yeah, no, to, uh, the, it'll uh, to be clinical yeah. advances. Uh, we generally think of, of death as a process that comes at the end of life, but uh, we've come to understand, and your work has been important here, that uh, death often has rather key roles in life at, at its inception. Uh, and I, I want to ask how this is regulated, and perhaps you'd address a somewhat philosophical question. Uh, what are the benefits, if one might ask that question, of, of, ex of structuring development in this way? So you're talking about cell death, cell cells death. dying. So cells die in huge numbers, uh, not only during development, but even as we speak. Mm -hmm. uh, hundreds of millions of cells are dying every minute in, in our bodies. Uh, the good news is for every cell that dies, a cell divides to replace it uh, if you're healthy. Uh, so it's quite clear that if you abolish this kind of cell death, and what makes this cell death so interesting is that there is a devoted intracellular program for this, de this death. So the cell is committing suicide in that sense. It's making a decision and killing itself in a very special way so that the debris is eaten and cleared very, very quickly. If you get rid of that death program, uh, then most animals, certainly mammals like us, uh, die very early in development, uh, looking terrible. So you really do need this cell death for lots of reasons in development. I mean, one, the way you get fingers on your hand is the cells between the developing hand uh, kill themselves mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. create these mm -hmm. uh, clefts and so on. And it's also a very powerful way of adjusting cell numbers so that they're in the right proportions in a particular organ. Kind of a pruning process in yes, a sense. Yes, dramatic. I mean, the fact is you overproduce most of the nerve cells in the developing brain are overproduced. Mm -hmm. So you make many more than you need. And then the ones that you don't need uh, kill themselves. Mm -hmm. 
So it's a way of adjusting the numbers of nerve cells as they connect to a target to adjust their number to the number of targets they're going to innervate. Mm -hmm. You could mm -hmm. see in evolution and in development, if you had to get the exact number right in both places, I mean, this is pretty difficult. But you matching know, problem, that, I mean, yeah. It's a matching problem. Yeah, so you yeah, make yeah. more than you need here, and they yes. come out and they find the right partner. The ones that don't die kill themselves, and the others survive, and it's a great way to build yes. a body. Yes. And so yes. it's, I think, pretty clear why evolution would have done it this yes. way. Yes, yes. Quite ingenious, quite ingenious. What, what is it uh, now, reflecting a little bit, uh, Martin, what is it that you enjoy most about scientific research? It's a, it's a complicated uh, process that we all pursue as scientists. It has many facets. What are the ones that you find give you particular pleasure? Well, I think any scientist would tell you uh, why they're doing it is the joy of discovery. I mean, it's a thrill to make a discovery. You have now discovered something. Nobody else knows this. You're the first one. That's a pretty exciting thing. Heady stuff. But on the other hand, an artist friend of mine once said, you know, you scientists, all you're doing is uncovering what's already there. We artists, every time we <laughs> paint or sculpt, we are making something that didn't exist before. So we're really creative. All you guys are doing is like archaeologists. You're kind of just uncovering what's already there. But the fact is, trying to figure out how the world works is, I can't think of a better way of mm -hmm. spending mm -hmm. your life, and the thrill of making a discovery, and of course if it turns out to be an important discovery, so much better, uh, that's why you do it. Yes. That's why I do it. Yes. I think that's why most do it. Yes, yes. Looking back, uh, if you were uh, entering uh, into science again, uh, perhaps as a graduate student or a young faculty member, uh, would there be something that you would do differently? Uh, uh, would you take a different path? Is there, any, is there any path that you perhaps wish you had taken but, but did not? Not really, but I'm often asked because I spent a lot of years doing medicine. I did, went to medical school for four years and I did internal medicine for two years. Then I did neurology for three years. So that's a big hunk of my life and no doubt your brain is at its peak during this mm -hmm. uh, period and I don't use that. Uh, there's no question. Um, almost all of that has not been useful for my scientific career. So if I knew I was going to end up as a scientist, I think I'd go to medical school mm -hmm. because knowing about disease and your body and what's important to take seriously and what you should ignore, which is most things, uh, is enormously useful for life. Mm -hmm. uh, but all the other years, uh, I think in retrospect, I would have entered science earlier. Kind of bypass that. Because that I second. didn't start in science until I was 30 years old. And, mm -hmm. you know, you're on the way down at 30, so <laughs> I probably would We're have done it earlier. Yeah, well, Don't ask. Let's not talk about <laughs> that. Let's not yeah. talk about that. The, uh, is there a particular... Uh, 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 process that you f have found um, uh, interesting or, or, or useful in your involvement with the private sector during your career. You've, you have been involved with several companies at different points. I think that continues even today. Uh, how, do you, how do you view the relationship between um, academia on the one hand, universities, research institutions, and and biotech companies, uh, pharmaceutical companies on the other hand. Uh, right, so let me make clear, although I am in the scientific advisory board of a couple of biotech companies, I've never started a company, I've never made any substantial money from any of these companies, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but my view is that biotech, which is the only uh, industry that I really understand at all, uh, has been an enormous force for good mm -hmm. in biology. So in my immunology days, Immunologists were spending an enormous amount of time trying to figure out these signals that lymphocytes are sending one to another. And they were identified as activities, but purifying these things and identifying the receptors just wasn't going anywhere mm -hmm. until the biotech started. And then within a couple of years, they purified these things, cloned the genes, had the receptors. And of course, these things then became tools for the basic scientists. Mm -hmm. uh, so it just caused the field to explode, and I think it's just not stopped. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there isn't, it's not all positive. I think there's a downside. And the downside is that biotech has become a very important part of most universities in a variety of ways. Many of the faculty are involved Certainly in biotech in some way. Yes. Uh, and this comes at a cost. The cost is that society 
no longer sees universities as objective sources of information that is disinterested and not tied to mm -hmm. industry, for mm -hmm. example. So all this push to include us and make us closer and closer to industry it comes at a cost. I think society no longer has the faith in the advice we might give that, and right. certainly in Britain, this is right. a major problem, right. a major right. problem. Right. Uh, people, you know, this thing about MMR, this va triple vaccine against mumps and measles and so on, uh, you know, the herd immunity is starting to fall because there was this very poor study that suggests there may be a link to autism. Many studies have shown this isn't true. But these intelligent people don't know what to do about their kids, whether they should vaccinate them or not. Sure. So they go to people at universities, and we say, of course vaccinate. And they say, yeah, but you're tied to biotechnology, the pharmaceutical industry that makes the vaccines. You would say that. And so I think society is going to pay a big price for this lack of trust mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. we now... Yes, yes. It, it seems very important to have some kind of a way of assuring ethical credibility. Uh, so, yes, so and this that, isn't that easy when no. you're talking about profit-making companies. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, there's one single question that uh, I want to close with, Martin. Our time has flown by here, um, but it's this. Um, if you had the opportunity, we put the hypothetical here, uh, to ask a single question of, uh, let's say, an omniscient deity, uh, what question would you ask? Oh my. <laughs> yes, well, I have to confess I don't believe in such a deity, but if there were such a deity. Yes, if there were. Yes. Okay, I, I, I find it very hard uh, to come in cold here, but there is an issue that I'm very concerned with, I've always been interested in, and that is these neuropeptides, these are signaling molecules made in our brain. We make at least a hundred of these, and we don't know what almost any of them do. And my suspicion is that most of the peculiarity of our colleagues, and almost all of us are peculiar in one way or another, uh, the answer will come in these peptides, the differences in the way we make them, respond to them, and so on. The differences are going to be subtle, but they're going to explain why some are more anxious than others, why some are optimistic and some are pessimistic. Yes, yes. And I would love to know that. I would love to know that. Yeah, well, certainly, under, I, I share your sense. This is a very large problem, uh, characteristically, uh, and understanding the personalities and the behaviors uh, of, of humans would be a, a fabulous advance uh, for us. Let me thank you for uh, joining me this evening, Martin, and thank you for joining us on UCSD Guestbook. Book.